Good morning. May I warmly welcome you in the Saviour's name to our service. And we pray that we would know the presence and the help of the Lord Jesus Christ as we worship together. Just like to begin by making some announcements. And as always on the news sheet on the back, can I draw your attention to the guidelines and restrictions that we have in place in relation to coronavirus. These are changing bit by bit as the weeks go by. And of course, one of the most recent changes was the regulations with regarding to face coverings. The situation being that face coverings are still required as you enter and exit the building, as you move around the building, and importantly, when you are singing. But as you sit in the pew or as you sit uh, around the church building, you are allowed to remove uh, your face covering if you wish. The second change that I would like to highlight today is that you'll see on the back of that, uh, uh, just further down in those guidelines and restrictions, is in relation to crash. We're pleased to announce that from this Sunday, the crash is now available uh, for use. However, we would ask that a parent or carer accompany their child into the crash. There'll be no rota, in other words, for the time being. Um, and also, uh, if it is possible, could you please bring uh, your own toys for your child and wear face covering in the crash room if there are other adults uh, present with you. And hopefully as time goes on, those restrictions will be eased uh, bit by bit, but for the meantime, they are in place. The rest of the restrictions are very much the same, and we'll keep you updated should anything change in relation to them. The Zoom Bible study uh, kicks off again tomorrow evening where we carry on with our study looking at the Gospel according to Luke. Uh, it starts at 7 p.m. and new Zoomers are very welcome. If you haven't uh, come along yet, you're more than welcome. It's a really good group and, and uh, it's, uh, it's a good opportunity for us to explore with a little more depth uh, the Word of God. Blobs meets on Tuesday at 9.30 in the McIntyre Suite. Uh, next Sunday, we will celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper together at the different time of 11.30, and I'll explain in a wee moment why that is the case, and 7 p.m. Both of those services will be exactly the same, uh, so please come to one or the other. Uh, we don't feel that we could get everybody safely in the building at once for communion, uh, so if you would come to one or the other, that would enable us to have the space to keep everybody safe and well. The reason for the change of the morning service uh, to 11.30 next Lord's Day is, of course, because of the marathon. The marathon which will run past the front of our building as it did on a previous occasion. That being the case, if you are attending morning worship next Lord's Day, please just be aware of that. Leave a little bit of extra time for your journey, perhaps. Um, and all being well, we'll be able to begin our service at 11.30. You'll see also on the news sheet uh, various announcements regarding harvest. I'll leave them for you to have a look at, um, and then next week um, I'll announce them with more detail. But please have a look at the harvest announcements there that we look forward to sharing in our harvest services on the 10th of October. So they are all our announcements, and as we gather together here today, we begin a new series looking at the seven churches of Revelation, the seven letters sent by Christ to the churches in that part of Asia, pointing them to um, a deeper understanding of what it means to be Christians and to be church communities. In many ways, the seven churches of Revelation ask us two questions. What sort of church do you want to be like? What sort of Christian do you think you should be? And we are prompted by those two questions to look at ourselves as individuals and ourselves as a church community and be that which would mirror and exalt the risen Christ. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, the one that we will consider today, and he calls them to be united in truth and love. But this is what he writes. As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body 
and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and all in all. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful schemings. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. For him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. That is our desire today, to be united in that body of truth and love. And that is why we sing to the praise of this Jesus, for his is indeed the name we honour. Jesus is the name we honour. Let us unite our hearts. Let us talk to God. Let's pray. Great God, Alpha and Omega, beginning and end of all things, creator, sustainer, provider, in your name we gather and before you we bow. Shield, 
and defender, tower of refuge for the weary, deliverer, redeemer, forgiver. In your name we worship, at your feet we kneel, for you are worthy of all praise. Forgive us for the things we have done and not done. Forgive us for the things we have said and not said. Forgive us for the lives we live and do not live, that we might reflect the image of Christ who we profess to follow. Help us that through your grace and strength that we would indeed recommit this day and re-energize to follow that Jesus, that through your forgiveness we would be inspired to honor him in thought, word, and deed. And to continue on this journey with him, discovering the true nature and wonder of who he is, so that we may discover more and more the true nature of who we are. And in that relationship, live as those who would draw other people into his light. We pray, asking these things, because you are the one to whom we can come. You're the one to whom we can open our hearts. You're the one who hears. And you're the one that guides. You're the one that provides. So we lift to you our prayers. Amen. Amen. Our first reading from the Word of God today is our Old Testament reading from the book of Numbers. uh, Starting at verse 14 of chapter 20. It's Numbers chapter 20 starting at verse 14. Just to put this little reading in context, we see the Israelites are traveling through the wilderness on their journey to the promised land. They have traveled through many dangers and unpredictable events, and they've found themselves really now um, just at the edge of the promised land. All they have to do now is go up uh, to the river and cross it. But in order to do that, they need to pass through some kingdoms that are there. And they wish to do that to make their journey faster and easier. But of course, all doesn't quite go to plan. So we pick up the reading there, as I say, at verse 14. Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom, saying, This is what your brother Israel says. You know all about the hardships that have come on us. Our ancestors went down into Egypt and we lived there many years. The Egyptians mistreated us and our ancestors. But when we cried out to the Lord, he heard our cry and sent an angel and brought us out of Egypt. Now we are here at Kadesh, a town on the edge of your territory. Please let us pass through your country. We will not go through any field or vineyard or drink water from any well. We will travel along the king's highway and not turn to the right or to the left until we have passed through your territory. But Edom answered, You may not pass through here. If you try, we will march out and attack you with the sword. The Israelites replied, We will go along the main road. And if we or our livestock livestock drink any of your water, we will pay for it. We only want to pass through on foot, nothing else. Again they answered, You may not pass through. Then Edom came out against them with a large and powerful army. Since Edom refused to let them go through their territory, Israel turned away from them. Amen. And we thank God for his word. Well, boys and girls, I think we have a few scattered about. And it's great to see you this morning. And and I'm going to come down in a wee minute to talk to you. I know you can't come up to me, but I'm going to come down there to be a wee bit closer to you. But before I do that, I want to show you a wee picture on the screen, hopefully, that's going to come up now. And you'll see on that screen a map. Now, this is modern-day Turkey, this country here is what we call Turkey today. But it wasn't called Turkey then, way back in the days of the Bible. And what we see on the map is 
How many stars can we see? Can anybody count those stars for me? Keep going. Seven. Well done. Brilliant. Seven stars. And these seven stars, because in each of these stars, there's a church like this one, a church, a group of people who follow Jesus and they live together and they worship Jesus. And what we see is that all of these churches were different and they all had different problems and they all had different things that were good about them and bad about them and all of that. So what happened was Jesus, by using a guy called John, sent letters to these seven churches to tell them how to serve him better and to love him more. So what I want you to think about today is Ephesus. That's a big funny word. Can anybody see where Ephesus is? There's Ephesus there, that star, the church in Ephesus. And in the church in Ephesus, God, through Jesus, sent a message to them. So I'm going to come down and show you something. So, this is an important piece of equipment. You can use this to carry things that you can't carry yourself. You can use this to put on chairs or tables or whatever you need to move around. Things that you can't lift by yourself. So, what I want to ask you is, how do I work this? Okay, so, do I put one hand on this handle and push? Oh, well, why does it go that way if I do that? What, what, why is it not working? Why is it not working? So I need to use the other handle. Okay. Oh, both handles. So both hands on both handles. Ah, right. Okay, both hands on both handles. Right, you see. Because you know what was happening in Ephesus? There's two big things going on in Ephesus. There was truth and there was love. And there was people who really wanted to make sure everybody knew the truth. And they went out and they told everybody the truth about Jesus. But you know what? They were very cross. And they were a bit angry about telling people the truth. And that was like that. They were pushing. And they weren't really doing it right. They had the truth, but they weren't really doing it right. And then there was those that had love. And they wanted to go out and just be friendly to everybody and tell everybody that Jesus loved them and there was nothing to worry about. And they were doing this too, with the other hand. And what the Bible was telling us in the letter to the church in Ephesus is that we need truth and love. Because when we have truth and love, look what happens. We can go the way that we are meant to go. And we can do the things that we are meant to do in Jesus' name. So remember that today. That to the church in Ephesus, and to me and you, and to the church here in Craig, God is saying you need to have those two things. You need to know the truth about who Jesus is. But you need to tell people the truth about who Jesus is in love. And you need to care for them and treat them with respect and to want good things for them. So when we have both those things, we can go the way that we need to go and be the church and be the Christians that we ought to be. So will we maybe say a wee prayer? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is your son, that he died for our sins, that he rose again from the grave, that he will come again to build his kingdom, and that he is the way to know your salvation. He is the way to have our sins forgiven. He is the way to be the best people that we can be. But Father, help us to, to say that and to show that in love and in care for other people. To not be cross and angry, but to be loving and gentle and to tell people that they need Jesus, but to do so in a way that shows our great love for them so that they and we and this church can go and live the way we should go and the way we should live. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I think we're going to sing again and we're going to sing about our great big God. Our God is a great big God.
Just before we come to open God's Word again for our second reading, I'm going to take some time now to pray for others to take that opportunity to lift to God our intercessory prayers. Let's do that together. Father, as Jesus told the waves and the storms to be quiet and to settle, we take a moment to be still together, praying for one another, for the world, for the church, for ourselves, for that which is near and far. We use this time to sit and talk to you, our God. Let us be still and quiet and lift to God our own prayers. Abba, Father, gracious God, what a wonder it is that we can take time to lift to you that which lies in our hearts. We thank you that you know us better than we know ourselves. So when we come to pray and when we don't quite know what to say, you understand you understand the things that worry us and concern us, the stories on the news that make us uneasy, the events that occur to our brothers and sisters in Christ that make us fearful, the struggles of a loved one that make us worry, the things in our own lives and in our own hearts that just niggle at us. We lift them all to you, each and every one, and the beauty of it is that as we do so, while our prayers are of that, of individuals, our prayers are gathered here together and there is power and strength in that. For we pray as a community of faith and we lift those prayers to you together and ask that they would be received at your throne of grace in and through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That beautiful and eternal name. We pray as always for your glory. Amen. Our second reading is from the book of Revelation, as you may have expected. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, the letter to the church in Ephesus. Once again, this is God's word to us today. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work and your 
perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. That you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. Amen. And once again, we praise the Lord for his word and the opportunity to read it here in safety together. Before we consider that word, let us still our hearts and minds once again, this time as we praise the Lord with this beautiful peace, be still. Let us stand and offer this sacrifice of praise to God. The book of Revelation, also known as the Apocalypse of John, is one of the strangest and most misunderstood books of the entire Bible. The word apocalypse is a perfect example of that, because that word in modern usage has come to mean disaster or, or doom. But actually, the word apocalypse just means to reveal or to, to make known, and that is exactly what is happening in this book of Revelation. The character and the nature of God and his plan is being revealed and set out for us to see. While there is much in the book that is frightening, while there is much that is pictorial and maybe hard 
to interpret. There is also so much to be encouraged by and strengthened by as we see God's kingdom come in wonder and glory and see the promises that he made fulfilled. After the introductory chapter, we are given the privilege to read seven letters. Letters, messages from Jesus to seven churches in Asia Minor. And as I showed the children, we'll see them again here in a wee moment. There again is, as I said to them, modern day Turkey, where the churches are located. And we see them spread out throughout that area. Now there were other churches there in those days. Uh, there were plenty of church communities throughout this area all around here. Um, and of course we know of the gospel going to places like Crete when we read um, of the movements of Paul and those who he sent in his name. But these particular seven churches are chosen um, because in each of them there is a particular issue which Jesus commends and celebrates or rebukes and tackles. And if you like, these seven church communities are case studies of what congregations are like, the problems that they face. So that all congregations, no matter where they find themselves and no matter in what age to which they belong, they can learn from those case studies and see themselves, if you like, in these churches. Asking themselves, are we a church like Ephesus or Smyrna or Thyatira? And if we are, why is that a good thing? And if we are, why is that not a good thing? And how can we, as I said at the start, be the Christians that we ought to be and be the church that we ought to be by looking at these examples here in the book of Revelation? Each of these church communities are not completely unlike this one. Okay, we speak in a different language than they did. We probably dress very differently than they did. Uh, we have screens and lights and all of this and stained glass windows and all the sorts of things that they wouldn't have had. But the essence is the same. A group of people coming together who claim to follow Jesus. Who come to profess their faith in that Jesus and to live for him. So when we think of these church communities, don't think of people who lived a long time away that have no connection to us. Think of churches very like this one made up of broken individuals coming together in the name of Jesus. People with real ups and downs, real challenges and real opportunities for change. And each congregation in, this, in these seven letters is critiqued in a unique way by Jesus as he assesses their life, their devotion and work as the people of God in their particular setting. So Ephesus is the site of the first congregation that Jesus addresses. And the New Testament tells us so much more about this church community than the others. We're very blessed to start off with Ephesus because we can go to other places in the New Testament and read a lot about what went on in Ephesus to get the background, to get the context, to understand the personalities involved a little bit more. It was planted by Paul, the church community there, during a brief visit um, the congregation went on then to be nurtured by some of Paul's co-workers, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, and then led by a very powerful, persuasive and eloquent preacher named Apollos. You can read all about that in Acts chapter 18, and I suggest you do that and to get a flavor of the story and that background. The story continues that Paul returned to Ephesus this time for a longer ministry three years or so where he worked alongside believers as they faced opposition and hostility because of their worship of Jesus instead of the Roman god Artemis. Later bidding farewell to the Ephesian elders Paul summons them and he says to them be vigilant protect God's sheep from the fierce wolves and false shepherds. Then writing from prison years later in the letter that we call Ephesians, Paul summoned the church to unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. He called them to maturity that would enable them to stand firm against what he called human cunning by craftiness in deceitful schemes. The apostle insisted that the church exercise theological discernment. In other words, that they focus upon the truth of who Jesus is and long for that truth and desire that truth that they would really know 
from the depths of their hearts and soul what it means to follow Jesus, that they wouldn't be led astray by popular worldly ideas and trends that were all around them, that they would stand firm and focused upon Christ. As Paul says, let no one deceive you with empty words. Paul says, cling together and cling together in the Lord Jesus Christ. Fast forward then today to the book of Revelation. And here we see Jesus. What a scene that we have privy to behold as the Lord of the church walking around the seven lampstands representing each one of these churches, holding the seven stars in his hand, ruling these churches, indwelling these churches by his spirit as they reflect his light into the world. As the Lord of the churches, much of what Jesus sees at Ephesus attracts his approval. Look to verse 2, where he highlights that the fellowship that Paul wanted them to have has taken heart. They have taken to heed his warning about predators from inside and from outside the congregation. So Jesus commends the church for its theological discernment in exposing fake and deceitful apostles. He also encourages them for refusing to tolerate the Nicolaitans later on in the reading whose behavior Christ himself says that he hates in verse 6. We don't really know exactly who they were or what they got up to but we can look to elsewhere in Revelation to kind of have an idea of who these Nicolaitans were. They were obviously very well known known in first century church communities and if we look to the church in Pergamum which we'll have a chance to study in a few weeks time uh, number three on the list we are able to get a bit of an insight into the situation and who these guys were jesus rebukes the church at pergamum for condoning and tolerating nicolaitan teaching the nicolaitans there are compared to balaam son of boar from long ago who in numbers 24 lured god's people into sexual immorality and idolatrous feasts by worshiping the Canaanite god Baal. We can therefore assume that they promoted a a loose theological conviction and moral standard, leading the church away from holiness and away from their devotion to Christ. So the Ephesians' refusal to tolerate these Nicolaitans and their practices um, are related to another quality that Christ commends them for in his letter. He says that for the sake of Jesus' name, they had endured much suffering, being marginalized in the city. You see, in Ephesus, life, community, and business were all centered around religious tourism and banking. And that was all centered around this big temple to Artemis, right in the middle of the city, where people could come and could enjoy a supermarket of gods, and can use their money to involve themselves in all sorts of strange immoral and sexual practices. This was the thing that drew people to that area of the city. This was the thing that kept the economy going. This was the thing that in order to be safe and well and financially secure, you had to be involved in. But the church in Ephesus began to obviously drift away from this more and more and they refused to celebrate the trade grill the trade guild rituals and as a result they risked exclusion and financial ruin but jesus praises them for that he praises them for their great faith by saying in verse 2 that the believers were enduring patiently and bearing up for his name's sake This reminds me of the Israelites in the wilderness. And again, we'll see another wee picture here now of them. The Israelites in the wilderness were God's people. They were cut off on their own. They were mistrusted by the world around them. They were isolated and hemmed in by their circumstances to the point where Edom would not allow them to pass through the land. If they were allowed to pass through the land, they could have followed the highway very easily up and then crossed the river somewhere around here, which was the original plan, into the promised land. But they were not allowed to pass. And you can see they had to go all the way around there, which on a map doesn't look like a whole lot. But after all they had endured, 
And after all they had suffered, they found themselves again in further wilderness, in further isolation, further cut off, again pushed to trust in God one more time, for one more journey, for one more stretch. They came to the land of Eden, and the army came out to face them. And not in a dissimilar way to the church in Ephesus, their faith was tested. And they had to trust that God would bring things together for good, and that his promises would be upheld, and they would make it. They would make it. In Ephesus, for the most part, this is what the believers in the city were doing. They were holding on to one another. They were holding on to Christ. They were holding on to God's promises. However, Jesus also found a flaw in the Ephesian congregation. He says directly challenging the church community in verse 4, you have abandoned the love you had at first. Now there could be lots of different meanings to uh, that verse. Um, Some people would perhaps suggest that they had in some way fallen away from their devotion to Christ. And perhaps that's true. However, unlike the compromising churches of Pergamum or Tyathea or Sardis or Laodicea, when we come to look at the church in Ephesus, we don't see a church that has been flirting with the gods of pagan religions. We see a church that appears to be standing firm in their love of Christ, in their desire to see him exalted. It would seem almost a disservice to downplay their apparent zeal for their Lord. So it means, I would suggest, much more sense to conclude that the love they had at first that Jesus warned them to not abandon was the love not for Christ, but the love that they have for one another. Paul in Ephesians 4 had labored hard to teach the church that their health as the body of Christ was dependent on speaking the truth in love. But it seems that the key qualification in love had somewhat been overlooked by a zealous defense of the truth here in Ephesus. Yes, their words were faithful to the teachings of Christ, but they were failing to, as verse 5 states, do the works that they did at first. Love each other the way they used to. The important message of Ephesus, and by extension for us, and for every other group who calls themselves disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, is this. Keep a firm grip on both handles. Truth and love. Not one, not the other, but both. Then you can go. Then you can live. Then you can work. And this is a necessary challenge Um, To seek to be a community faithful to the Lord, we must seek this harmony, that tension, that balance. To be, as John Bunyan says, valiant for the truth, but to love deeply those that surround us as well. To see the Bible as the instructions and guidance for life that it truly is, that word of God that speaks to us and should be upheld and honored, and to be fierce in our defense of it but also to be fierce in our love for one another, to see ourselves as a church community, those who are bound together in Christ, and then to reach out in love to those who do not belong to Christ, speaking the truth to them in love so that they would see his light and join with us. We are to be those who are to keep a firm grip on both handles. It's not easy, but it's a worthy goal to chase The challenge is not to swing like a pendulum from one to the other. And we can all think of examples. We can think of that cold, ungracious, but very theologically correct Christian. But we can also think of that very warm and open Christian who really doesn't have any idea what the Bible has to say into someone's life. And both of those examples are ineffective as one does not give that love and warmth that is required to echo and to display the love and warmth of Christ. And the other one finds themselves watered down to the extent that when it comes to the crunch, they don't really have anything different from the world to say because they don't know what the scriptures say. If we truly love one another, we would grab both of those handles. That would be the result of us knowing the Bible and desiring to live in that love. And it is a sober thing that Christ says, that if the 
church in Ephesus doesn't get a grip on these two handles. He'll remove their lampstand. This is important enough for Jesus that both theological truth and love for others are held in this blend that this is held together for his glory. But Christ's last word, and as we tie this together, we see his last word and share it together in verse 7, decrees that to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. In other words, he says, those who grasp both these handles of truth and love, they have found the secret to true life with him. They have found the secret of what it really means to be a disciple of Christ. They have found that that is the key. A noble pursuit above all others. A quest worthy of all that we are. That by faith in Jesus and what he has achieved for us upon the cross. And won for us by raising from the empty tomb. Should inspire us to reach out with both hands. And grab both handles. Both of truth and love. Is that the type of Christian that you are, that I am, that I love the Bible and read the Bible, long to know more about the Bible, take every opportunity to, to feast upon it and to actually look out to others who surround me in love, even those that are hard to love, especially those who are hard to love? Because that's what we are prompted to do today by this letter to the church in Ephesus as individuals and as a community of the church. Might we redouble our efforts and our desire today to read the Bible and to care for the Bible, to defend the Bible, but also to love one another as we ought and to love the world for Christ's sake. Let's pray together. Father, help us to think very deeply about this challenge of Christ. To grab those poles of truth and love. To run with those handles firmly in our hands. Forgive us when we neglect the Bible. Forgive us when we neglect our study of it. And help us by your spirit to recommit today. And Father, if we are unsure about where to start or what to do, Father, help us to talk to somebody who would steer us in the right direction. And Father, as we consider the great love that you have shown to us in Jesus, help us to live in that love by how we look and treat and respond to others. Help us to see one another, not just as a family of people who gather in a church once a week, but those who are bound together in Jesus. And help us to be more gracious and forgiving to one another. Father, maybe you bring us here today and as we sit in this place, someone comes to mind that we have a struggle with. Someone comes to mind that we have a friction with. And Father, we, we want to repent of that. Help us to be more forgiving and gracious in those circumstances and help us to look towards that person for only good things for them. And Father, those who would profess to be our enemies we do so likewise we ask that you would help us to be forgiving and gracious towards them and that through seeking to live in a way that is loving and gracious and focused upon Christ we might know better that Jesus who was forgiving and gracious to us and we might see his kingdom extended little by little bit by bit in our hearts in Craig and further afield. So Father, as we bring our service close to a close, we ask that you would help us to be deliberate in our quest for truth and deliberate in our living in love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As our service comes to a close, we use the words of come people of the risen King.
And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be ours and ours to share this day and indeed forevermore. Amen. Amen.